So we'll just wait for a few people to join us and then we'll, I'll just make some announcements and then I'll introduce you too and then we can go. And Okay, good evening to everyone that's joined so far, to all the viewers and the fellow colleagues. I'm gonna just wait another two to three minutes for some of the colleagues to still join. I see we're sitting on 62 attendees so far. There was about, we can expect about 250 to 200. So let's just give everyone five minutes. It's not yet seven o'clock. I think we've got four minutes left and then we'll start. Everyone can just relax still. We got two more minutes for seven o'clock and then we'll begin. Okay, so good evening to all the viewers and our fellow colleagues. If anyone is struggling to hear, then please just make a note or write a note to us in the Q&A section. Uh, we'll just wait one more minute for a few more colleagues to join us. But while we're waiting, I'll start off the evening as usual, as we always do, by just going through some house rules and some announcements as well. So we're honored to have with us two very sought after speakers in the industry today. 
And I'm sure that all of us will benefit greatly from the presentation that Dr. Debia and that Brahm will be presenting for us. So some of the house rules before I introduce the speakers while we're waiting for uh, viewers to join in is on the Zoom platform, if we can just refrain from using the and function. If you have a comment or if there's a problem hearing or any technical difficulties or even questions when we're doing the Q&A, then please use the Q&A tab. If there is difficulty logging on to Zoom, then the presentation is also being live streamed on YouTube. Tonight's event will qualify for one clinical CEU. So the CPD certificates will be loaded onto the SADA platform as it's always been done and you'll be able to access the certificates under your profile. To those who are not SADA members, and firstly, I need to ask you why they are not, uh, but you still can access your CPD certificate. You just need to create a profile and, and to get the certificate there. Also, please remember to complete the evaluation after the webinar is complete. Okay, so one, another reminder is that on the 27th, the 28th and the 29th of this month, we will be hosting the South African Dental Association Dental and Oral Health Virtual Congress. So to register for this, please visit the website www.sadacongress.co.za. It will be one not to be missed. There are exciting topics and excellent speakers who will be taking part in this virtual Congress. Remember, we don't, you don't have to register for all three days. You can register for one day, two days, or for three days to benefit from these speakers. And another event that's coming up on the 5th of August is a webinar which will be presented by Mrs. Kobler. That information should be emailed to everyone. You can register for that webinar as well. Okay, so let me start by introducing Mr. Bram from Bram World Dental Ceramics. His interest in dentistry started at a young age, having had family in the dental industry. He qualified as a dental technologist at Swane University of Technology in 2004. And following his qualification, he worked as, worked as a dental technician at a dental laboratory in Pretoria where he learned various skills of the trade. In 2008, he opened the doors to his own lab, World Dental Ceramics, specializing in aesthetic metal free crown and bridge work, prosto as well as implantology. In line with his passion for aesthetic dentistry, he has attended numerous international conferences to gain insights into the latest technologies. He constantly pushes the boundaries of his work, thinks outside of the box and innovates to achieve the most natural looking smile he can get. Ram is also part of the dream team of Ragma Moy, which is shown on DSTV channel 147 as a dental technologist that works side by side with the dentist to give the contestants their dream smile. I'm sure many of us have seen this program. Dr. De Beer qualified as a dentist from the University of Pretoria in 2009. And it was then when his passion for reconstructive and aesthetic dentistry was born. He specializes in the field of aesthetic dentistry and obtained his postgraduate qualification in oral implantology through the Implant and Aesthetic Academy, and as well as laser dentistry from Aachen University in Germany. He plays an integral part in, he played an integral part in establishing the first CDE practice in Cape Town and partnered with Dr. Dr. Zach Shabbat to grow the flagship practice into one of the leading practices in the country. I'm sure all of us know of their practice. Dr. Zach and Dr. Vim de Beer work side by side at the Cape Town practice and their joint interest in aesthetic and cosmetic dentistry makes them the perfect team. Dr. De Beer is also one of the official dentists on the South African makeover show on TSTV channel 147, which is a complete makeover show for the less fortunate. So I'm not gonna waste more time. I think I'll give over the platform to Dr. De Beer and to Brown, and they can begin with their presentation. Yeah, thank you for the beautiful introduction. Sorry, I was speaking on mute. Um, we were just discussing who, which one of us is going to run first because <laughs> of the nerves. But anyways, uh, let's let's start. Uh, can I can I share the the presentation for you? Yes, yeah, you can share the presentation so the viewers can have a look at it as well. Perfect. Okay, so before we start, really thank you very much for the for the incredible opportunity of you guys wanting to listen to us and 
giving us uh, the opportunity to just show you what we do in everyday practice. And Ram and I have been working together for 10 or 11 years. Yeah, and um, it would be the greatest pleasure just to show you quickly our basic workflow in um, clinic to lab communication during everyday small makeover. Small makeovers. Okay, but anyways, okay, here we go. Brom, you ready? Yeah, are you? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Okay. Okay. Okay, so it, it starts with the with the whole framework of the process of seeing a patient from start to finish with a small makeover. Obviously, the patient arrives first during the consultation. Uh, during this consultation, you you can really kind of start with the patient and hearing what they want. And it's it's very important for us to, to focus on the patient's well-being and that the focus should be on what they want, not what we want. So a patient can, for example, come in and uh, have terrible teeth and we can just kind of force a makeover on them. But if that's not what they want, that's not what they're going to get. So we really have to focus on what the patient wants. And from there on, we can work. Uh, if a patient comes in for a small makeover, the first thing we, we do is take an impression, take photos, get to work very quickly uh, in gathering data. Data is really the biggest thing for us moving forward. And uh, it gives an unbelievable, unbelievable amount of info that we can use in order to achieve the best smile we can possibly get. Uh, one, of the, one of the big things is, is also before we do a makeover, even if a patient comes in and they only want a makeover, do your due diligence. Go through everything. Make sure that the fillings are fine, the implants are placed, all the gaps are closed, any other type of thing. It's exactly the same as with doing orthodontics. You don't put brackets or do orthodontics on a patient who has restorative work or, or have other things go. So we first do that. And from there on, we can move forward. Okay, so once we've, once we've seen the patient during the consultation, we will then go for a quick impression, photos, planning, and then fit the wax up on the next appointment. Uh, with the wax up, we will just quickly take photos again, give a quotation, then we only get to the prep day, then we do a cementation and then follow ups. Sorry for the quick, but this is like a broad overview of the whole presentation. Okay, so firstly, the patient arrives at the practice and you get patients who book for a makeover immediately. And then you get patients who just come in, they know about makeovers, but they don't really want it. So, and the big thing is, is, yeah, is to really focus on what the patient wants and their well being, obviously. So, if you can see a patient that's very low self confidence, just, just make a suggestion. Okay, so the communication with the lab, because uh, this is the, the big topic of tonight, is the communication between lab and clinic during, during a small makeover. And the, the communication really starts on the consultation. It doesn't start on prep day, which most I know most practices only send the first information to the lab on prep day. So big thing again, big note, patient wishes. Make, any, make, a, make notes of this. If a patient wants their teeth longer or shorter or whatever, um, make notes of this because we can get carried away very easily um, giving the patient what we actually feel is right. But we've had, of I've made that mistake by investing too much in the, in the technical part of doing a small, a small makeover correctly and really disregarding what the patient wants and what the patient wants to change. So it's very important to make these notes and make sure that you tick those boxes when you make that smile, even if it's not 100% perfect. There are no straight lines in nature. So uh, if the patient wants not too sharp laterals, uh, um, canines, don't give them that. Uh, it's just a simple example, but listen to the patients. That's the big thing. Uh, photos and impressions at every single appointment, every single opportunity that you can get, because it gives you a lot of information. Okay, 
So this is just a few examples of the of the type of photos we take. I've, I've uh, learned all of these type of photos from, from digital small design, which I will get to later. But this is the basics that you need in order to give the lab the best possible information you can. That's the frontal smile. It's just basically a full face where you can see the lips, the eyes, the nose, the, the ears. You will mainly use this, uh, this photo uh, for the eyes, which I will get to later. Okay, frontal retracted, just to get the lips out of the way so that you can still see the eyes and kind of move down from the eyes and get the horizontals for the gingiva, the, the incisal edges, the soft tissue borders and so forth. Okay, so a close-up smile. This will just be a nice little reference and to zoom in for Brahm uh, to be <laughs> able to, to, to get the correct lens. Uh, close-up retractor, uh, the 12 o'clock. This is really to use, uh, or we use this to really see the incl inclination of the front teeth, whether they procline or retrocline. And um, in this case, the patient has so much wear that you can't see the, the uh, front incisors. This is a better option, or, or this is a better example to show you what exactly we want to achieve with the 12 o'clock. We can, or Brahm can then, it's, it's not really for us, but it's, it's more for, for Brahm and the lab to be able to know which teeth are moving forwards and backwards and which they can build up and which they need to prep away. Okay, then we do also a full facial video. This is very beneficial to see not a still image, but a moving image of how the patient lips move in regards to their teeth, how much they show, and so forth. Okay, then there's a functional video of, so that Brom can just see, if, for example, in this case, you can, you can clearly see there's no canine guidance, and that's the problem. So if you don't fix the canine guidance, um, any porcelain that you will put on will just chip and debond very quickly. So the chewing um, close-up video, gives you a lot of information in regards to what went wrong initially with the, with the teeth. And the, the odds are very good that if it went wrong with the teeth initially, it will go wrong with your porcelain that you put on. Porcelain, resin, whatever you want to put on, it's probably going to go the same path. Um, there's a wax up fabrication then from the photos. This, uh, these photo sets uh, really give the lab a fighting chance. The eyes that I spoke about earlier, we use the horizontal of the two pupils um, to, to get kind of a facial horizontal, which we then pull down, which I will show in the next slide, so that we can get a good idea of where the horizontal must be. It's like a kind of a modified fox plate. Um, the horizontal we use for the gingival heights as well as the teeth because we, if we want to do a smile the pink and the white should match and both should go on the same level in order to get that really kind of next level result not an average just a no yeah because a lot of the, the makeovers and uh, that i see um the guys neglect to gingiva so I always remember doing doing the gums as well. That that takes you to a world, or that's what I feel, and that's um, what I want to kind of aim is is for world class results. Um, you can see the midline of the, uh, according to the face. Uh, you can see soft tissue borders. I will get to that later, and avoid cats. Uh, all of these photos really come from digital smile design. It's a facially driven concept. It takes you away from the fact where you uh, where the technician that just designs a smile from a cast model there's no way from that telling where it actually is in the face and digital smile design changed my journey in doing smile makeovers in 2014 and it's been developed by christian coachman like most of us know uh, and the concept has a dual purpose it's really to show the patient what is possible as well as to guide the lab so that they have the full picture. And that's really, except for showing the patient what is possible, I want to give the lab as much info so they can get every single case right. Because you get a good reputation from not having to redo a lot of cases. So if you can make your cases as predictable as possible, 
you will eventually build up a immaculate um, kind of uh, reputation and patients will, will just come to you. And yeah, you can only achieve that by being predictable and scientific with this type of things. So uh, I would highly recommend if there's no, uh, if, if a doctor or a dentist wants to start doing this, go to Mark Bauer's course. He's the only DSD accredited uh, coach or, or trainer in, in Africa. So it's definitely highly, highly recommended to do that because it gives you so much insight in the info that, that you need in order to give the lab everything you need. This is just one of the, I, I'm not here to teach DSD. Uh, this is just a quick um, example of what we can achieve just by looking at one photo with the correct lines. So this is what I meant about using the pupils as the horizontal and drawing it down towards the, the gingiva and the incisal edges. And here uh, in this patient, we can immediately notice that the gingiva are offline. So we're going to need a gingivectomy here. So then we can quote the patient on that. We, uh, his smile does have a little bit of a, it's offline. And, and I marked it here in, 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 the, in the most lower line that you can see. This just shows Brom that this is how the model is running currently. And if he just looks at the model, he will produce a wax up that is running exactly as skew as that. So now he knows um, that the right or the left side is lower than the right, so he can get the horizontal correct. And over to Brom, at last. <laughs> well, Sorry, uh, no, <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Um, yeah, well, uh, thank you very much, Vim. Um, so all that information Vim shared now with you guys is actually very crucial for the technician or the lab, because like you said, uh, we don't sit with the face, we got no idea. We get, we get stuck with an impression or into oral scan, and then we have to start manufacturing a wax up. So we got no idea if it's the right midline, the horizontal lines, is the, if the patient's actually showing enough teeth. So before we actually start with uh, fabrication or, um, of the wax up, we take all the uh, above uh, information, which is uh, shared from the clinic to the lab, and vice versa. Sometimes we will uh, phone each other between and just discuss the, the, the case as well when it's very, uh, like a very complex case. But yeah, we take all the information, then we will take um, and choose basically the right shape, length and size from the DSD, Ben will share with me, um, and which actually will suit the patient. So basically how we do it in the lab, we take all this information of DSD, have a look at the patient's face. You can see it's an oval face. We will use it like an oval type of uh, shape of uh, tube. And when it's like a square face, we will go more to a square shape or triangular, et cetera. But you know, on the DSD, you can actually see the length. Uh, in this case, uh, you can see the patient doesn't show any top teeth, more bottom teeth. So we want the patient to actually show his smile, new smile off. So that DSD is very crucial with the length of the teeth and the width of the teeth. So when we fabricate it, there's two ways of fabricating it in the lab. We can um, fabricate it by hand and a lock or by the new latest software. So in, in um, CAD. But in my uh, experience, I quite prefer doing it by hand still. Um, the reason for that is I can still prep away on the model. I can still not prep away. We want to do minimum invasive uh, prepping, um, which is the greatest way of doing uh, prepping for a smile makeover. Uh, you just don't want to discard a whole uh, natural tooth if it's a healthy tooth, just want you to try to smile. And um, yeah, you get the, the, uh, the digital way of doing it as well, but as well, uh, digital is written by somebody. So the parameters is set to a specific creator who actually wrote the program. So there are definite borders. So if you're dealing with very difficult cases, there are kind of areas where it's just gonna bomb up. Yeah, you, you, you can't, you, I don't know, a lot of you guys got um, cat cams and stuff like that, you will design a crown and suddenly there's all the spikes going. So with, uh, with the analog way, <laughs> the only spike is in your head and you can actually quite fix it quickly <laughs> and stop resetting your computer from the start. 
So, well, after we did uh, the wax up, um, we will then send it back to the clinic or dentist. The dentist can try it in, and then we can have the custom mock up for the patient. And that's a nice way. The patient's got, uh, when he tries it in, or he can use it as, as stem cells as well, but he gets this, the patient gets this feel of how the teeth is actually going to look, the final product and everything. Sorry, you just seem to be okay. stuck. Oh, there we go. So, yeah, like I just explained to you in the previous slide, so I prefer to doing the analog way, that's by hand. So we received the, um, the impression or the interoral scan. We then do two study models, one original set, and the other one we will manufacture the, the wax up um, or the mock up on top of that. So we can have it before and after. After that, uh, we've got a digital wax up. Same uh, principle goes for it. You will incorporate everything to your CAD software. You will just do it in the, by digital and then do 3D printed models. Also, one original and one with the wax up, we just did digital. After the wax up, wax up has been done, we do a wax up uh, index. Uh, we normally do it with lab putty or a silicon uh, index. This is a great thing for the dentist uh, and the patient. The patient then can um, get a try and if we didn't do any prep work on it, teeth, which is not always the case. But in certain cases, you don't even need to prep the teeth to get this uh, result. Or the dentist can use it as embryos for the patient. And this is my, uh, I, I quite like this. Uh, this is thing me and Vim actually started a while back as uh, a prep guide. It's not a, it's not telling the dentist exactly how to prep. So don't get me wrong there. It's just a nice. Oh, so, so the dentist, leave your egos at home. <laughs> and uh, if they, if you really want to save enamel, I think uh, a prep guide will, will help you a lot in, in, just showing you where the technician actually wants you to remove teeth so that you don't just remove teeth all around, uh, not really knowing uh, what you're doing. So the, so the idea from, from the prep guide that, that, that we did a lot, uh, you know, kind of more the, uh, towards the beginning, <laughs> and I, I will, after this presentation, start using it a lot more. Um, it's, it's really just to show you, because there's no way that you as a dentist can can look at it at a small and know exactly where the uh, where the enamel needs to be removed. And remember, we want to save as much of the natural biology as we can. That's that's the point of modern dentistry. There's no um, grinding away 70% of the tooth anymore. That's gone. And if you, yeah, yo, hopefully you're not doing that. I'm not judging. But anyway, sorry. Back to bronze. <laughs> yeah, no, so the perfect spot on. <laughs> so it took us a while to get to this thing. So um, because as a technician, you get quite frustrated. You do this perfect wax up and uh, you get a prep back and then there's no space for the porcelain you're gonna have to use. And especially with uh, Emacs, you need a little bit of space to give uh, strength to the porcelain. So you need a minimum 0.5 uh, millimeter of space just to get the strength out of it. So this oh, is a and, great, great tool. And if your prep, if your prep isn't fine, then getting the patient back for a reprep and a re-impression is just not a good example That's or a good fine. image that, that you want to really take. But the thing is, is, in the beginning, if you're starting out, freaking do it. Get the things perfect. And the patients will also, uh, in, a, in a way, appreciate it if you phone them and say, listen, something went wrong. We want to get it perfect for you. So there's nothing wrong with calling the patient back and getting it right. Okay, so now, now we're at the practice again, uh, back from the lab and we received the wax up. So the first thing that we will do is side by side, show the patient uh, the before and after. This already has a massive wow effect for, for the patient. But if you really wanna take the patient to the promised land, fit that wax up into their mouth. This is what we're doing with the transfer tray that the, that Brahm will make for us or any lab if you request it. This is just a, a perfect copy of, of the wax up that you can fit on into the patient's mouth. Uh, this is just a short video of showing how we do it with just some temp material. We just shrink fit it, obviously beforehand, just clean the teeth, polish them a little bit, just get all the plaque off so that um, 
yeah, otherwise the temps will just really come off very quickly. This is just a short video of how we put it in. Just make sure it seats properly, press out all the air bubbles, make sure it, uh, it kind of molds nicely. Okay, and this is when we take it out. And this is kind of the gold. This patient doesn't even know what his smile looks like now. I don't know if you guys remember what it looked like before, but this is on another level. So this is the fun part where we can actually show the patient after the photos, obviously before and after. And listen, if this is not a selling point, I don't know what is, but it's also, yeah, this, this is also, but remember, this is a selling point in order to, to get the patient to obviously do the treatment, but taking photos of the wax up is extremely important for Brahm as well, because he can make a wax up from the model. Uh, for example, if he's maybe tired on the no, day or whatever. Any information that can go wrong. <laughs> yeah, I'll just call it tired. <laughs> but um, if, if, if there's maybe a mistake, uh, if there's a big camp or or the horizontal is not is not right, then from these photos, we can then correct anything when we go to the final product. This is even before we've prepped. This is all just that we show the patient again. This is a video just to give him a chance to just look at the new him. This also gives Brahma a good indication of or the, the lab about how the lips move. Uh, in the in the video which we took, and it's very nice to put them side by side. I unfortunately didn't do it with this. Um, the video will show you in the beginning that he, he barely showed any teeth when he was speaking yeah. or laughing or anything. And in this video, it's just it's it's another person. The downside to the transfer tray and the uh, and the wax up is that it can't be done for everyone. The wax up can be done for everyone, but the transfer of that into the mouth can't be. For Brahm, I think you can also explain this very nicely. But if a patient has like a bulky tooth that you're gonna need to prep a lot away from, or or has an orthodontic problem mostly where you want to do clear aligners or orthodontics. Um, there's usually a tooth in the way. So if Brown needs to prep the, the model in order to put wax there, you cannot transfer that onto the real, uh, on, on, onto the mouth because the tooth will be in the way. So that's not going to work. So you have to know that if there's any orthodontic or big orthodontic issues or very bulky teeth, which are a little bit pro -client, you cannot do that. And you have to be kind of satisfied with just showing the patient the wax up the physical model wax ups before and after. So when the patient, now we get to the, the actual acceptance of, of the smile makeover. Um, I hope you guys kind of know how, how much info there has been um, coming from the clinic to the lab and back uh, before we have even started. That big thing we wanna kind of uh, put across to everyone. Um, so, whether the patient accepts it or not, um, you, you really get advantages out of both. So if the patient accepts, which is obviously the, what we want, um, all the planning is done and Brom knows exactly what he needs to be, he needs to do. So you can prep that work and go play golf or whatever and not worry for a moment that it's gonna be fine. Um, if the patient does not accept, there's still advantages. You get a good report as a clinician um, even if the patient doesn't accept. So they will start speaking about you are extremely thorough. Um, wow, this was a very cool experience. No one has ever done this, whatever. Uh, you, you can plant the seed of the makeup because I personally have had consultations, which I did in, let's say, 2012, and they only booked in 2016 out of, the, uh, out of nowhere. It's just because you've planted the seed. Uh, it's also not really you don't you don't make a loss out of it. You make a small profit out of the out of the um, the wax up fabrication and the transfer, um, and the patient gets a little bit of amusement as, uh, as well because you send that patient home with that transfer um, or, or the wax up uh, to show their family. So they they get a lot of amusement, and if they want to do it, great. If they don't want to, yeah, they're happy. So. Um, 
the other thing is, is it's really good material for social media. It's a, it's a big thing in, in modern day industry. Um, use anything you can for social media. Show stuff that you're doing around the practice and doing a transfer of a wax up is an amazing chance to, to put that on social media, put that on your stories. Uh, people want to see this kind of stuff. So now we get to prep day. So yeah, once again, now all the way, hard work is done. Yeah, 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 not for, yeah, okay. But anyways, <laughs> if you want to see it like that, but the prep day is two hours of hell for the dentist. Um, but anyways, now, now we get to the prep day at last. But we know exactly where we're going to go. We know exactly if we want to um, do gingivectomy or crown lengthening, which you do way prior to the prep day, if it's indicated. Um, you give the technician now the, just the general info that everybody knows. If there's a dark prep, take a photo of it, take a shade, uh, make sure that the, that the technician exactly knows uh, what he's dealing with in regards to doing porcelain because it is translucent and will show what's going on beneath it. You, you pack cord, you do a lab putty bite. Um, the lab putty bite is one of my favorites and Brom, you also no, no, agree. I love it. Um, I love it. You can give I'm, so much detail you can give me. Yes, yeah, exactly. And it, it it's so much better than a wax pipe because you can really make it thick and uh, it's extremely accurate and, and rugged. And when you kind of make it very thick, you can mark all the denture principles that I still use today, even with DSD and everything, I still do uh, every makeover with denture principles. I mark the midline on the bite, exactly like you would do with a bite registration. Mark the smile line, eye smile line, everything according to the correct horizontal. This is just a quick indication of the prep guides. Uh, the photo on the right is really too much light. So I wanted to, to, to show something where, uh, but Brom will still know that prep is kind of around A1. But the photo on the left is better lighting. So when you're doing the shade taking, it's very important to, to use proper lighting. Otherwise, you can really throw the technician off. But still, the shade um, in regards to the prep will give a good indication of where we, we currently are. But also, yeah, if you have root canal teeth and all the amalgam uh, stain teeth and stuff, you have to do this. Um, just back in cord, just to show the, the technician exactly um, the margins, but that's basics. Um, this is the example that I mentioned earlier in a, where I used a lab putty. I really use a lot of lab putty when I take a bite, just so I can do that basic principles, denture principles, where you can show the, the resting lip line, the smile line, as well as the midline. So from the DSD and the, the bite registration with all of this info, Brom cannot make a mistake. <laughs> Uh, I would say that's true. Yeah, and still we have reviews. I must admit, everything does not go perfectly. Human. But listen, yeah, uh, from my side, uh, I feel I'm clean, and it's all the lab's fault. Uh, well, uh, obviously, can't defend myself this time. <laughs> I'm not oh, there to you. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Vim. Yeah, thank you very much for putting pressure on me. You explained it so nicely there. Well, um, before we manufacture um, the crowns of veneers of the smile, um, we take all the above in consideration what well, we're supposed to as technicians and labs. And um, yeah, we ask for that specific long period of time, but uh, yeah, stuff happens in the lab and we can go, we can talk, talk a long time about that. But before we manufacture the final crowns, we're looking at a final um, shade, um, what the patient actually chose. So if the patient had like an A3 and want to go back to a B1, we have to take the, the prep shade in, in consideration if it's possible with a high translucency, low translucency. And then um, between me and Vim, uh, or Zach as well, a couple of guys, we actually came up with a, a thing of a final smile so we, we call it a natural smile or a hollywood smile so um these days like you all know the, the youth is on instagram permanently on facebook and everybody wants to look like tom cruise uh, and um yeah they want that bright <laughs> white smile so we got a saying of the hollywood smile so then the uh, the 
clinic can transfer it or discuss it with the patient and um, what type of smile they want because the patient has really got this idea what they are looking for because they really did Dr. Google and they've always been on Instagram already. So they already got this idea. So it's hard to, to uh, transfer it over to the, the dentist itself and to the lab. So that's a key factor to just break up in your practice or between you and your lab, uh, my, come up with something and say, listen, I want a, I want a straight smile or uh, I want a natural smile smile or something like that it's just it's nice to know so the good big thing is just listen to the patient and say uh, listen to what they want because you can put a natural smile which is perfect oh, yeah. for this patient that they came in for hollywood they're not gonna like it you're gonna redo that guys being there listen <laughs> yeah listen being there uh, so and then, it's our, our own faults <laughs> yeah, yeah no, for sure good. And then always, obviously the type of material. So if there's discoloration, I normally use zirconium to block out the discoloration of the prep. Otherwise, if it's not that bad, we will go with lymphoid, uh, the silicate, which is, well, I use quite a bit of Emacs. And then also, that's a key thing is uh, if there were any adjustments made by the, um, by the wax up, trying. So if the horizontal lines wasn't right, or the midline was a bit off, just have a look at that. Um, Vim normally takes a, it takes a new impression after he reshapes the trine with the, uh, the wax up. And that gives me a, a quite an idea. Uh, like I previously said, I don't sit there with the patient in front of me with the lips, everything. So yeah. I just sit with a pair of models. But wrong, we don't want to give all our secrets away today. Okay, no, 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 no. <laughs> next time. <laughs> Okay, so uh, all the uh, above uh, photos have been taken with a smile line. Uh, There's a smile light. Um, they call it smile light. Uh, it's got two diffusers, a polarized uh, lens, which is quite cool with the polarized lens. You can get a uh, basic color shade of the chroma. So if you do shade taking uh, in the clinic or in the lab um, to see if your crowns uh, matches what the clinic sent you, uh, the polarized lens is remarkable cool. It gives you that spot on um, dentine color you want. And then the diffusers is just to take the glare off the teeth. So you don't want it shiny bits like uh, I think Vim just mentioned on one of the pictures we took the, the shade where it's a little bit glary so you can see it. Yeah. So you just want to take that glare completely off. And the nice thing about this is you don't need lenses and this big flashes. Yeah, very expensive Kodax. You just use your phone, phone. and click it on there. Uh, but you can. L listen, if you can, get a big Kodak with the big ring flashes and put up a studio in your practice, definitely go for it. But I think this is um, this is what I use every day. And uh, um, and it works fine. So I, I really have no problems with with taking proper intraoral photos. Okay, and then, um, yeah, well, that's basically one of the greatest tools in the clinic and in the lab, and uh, we correspond in with each other with that at all time. So uh, before we manufacture the final smile, uh, there's a couple of stuff we have to take in consideration. So, uh, like I said, is um, the Hollywood or natural smile looking. And then, uh, then me as technician will, discuss, will decide in what way I'm going to do it. So I'm going to do it either with full contour, um, then uh, wax up by hand and then press. Press is just a system we, we use in the lab where we actually uh, wax it up by hand and we can uh, uh, invest it and burn it out in the burn, uh, burn out furnace and then press it with a lithium silicate ingot. Uh, the why the reason why we're doing that uh, we get a little bit more uh, material out of it. The other way of doing it is full contours. You can also do it in your CAD software, and then you can mill it. Uh, everybody knows a, a Serona system. That's basically what it is, but it gives you more materials to use. So you can use zirconium, PMMA, uh, PM, uh, Emacs. So it gives you quite a quite a way of doing this stuff. So you get more material you can use. Uh, you can't press zirconium at all. So you're gonna have to go that way if you wanna use zirconium anyways. Um, and then stain and glaze. Uh, laying techniques, uh, basically what we do is we do a substructure as like a little coping wall, wax up, press or mullet, uh, you, you can decide. 
all your technician decides it normally and do a build up fully with porcelain. And then the cutback technique, my favorite technique, I use that quite often every day in the lab. Hook onto a, a crown veneer, press or melt, a cutback uh, incisal bookily and put some porcelain on it to get that natural look. Yeah, the thing is, there's lots of controversy in regards to the techniques of making a crown and um, in True. regards to strength. And, and yeah. there's uh, many ways to roam in a, in, a, in a way, and there's many, many ways to, to do something, and it's, and it's still fine. And you just have to choose as a, as a dentist, because you recommend which technique, and the, and the lab, to a very big extent, chooses what they want to do. But you have to decide what type of work you want to present the patient. And uh, I can maybe speak a little bit later if we have time about that. But really, everything, I've, I'm not really against or for any specific way of doing things. Just as long as you get the patient what they want, we must remember that the, it's about the patient's well-being. And if, if, if they come in and they ask you for a really beautiful translucent tip um, uh, porcelain work, you're not going to do a full con to it because it, it's never going to get there. No, it's it's just... never, never going to get there. So uh, yeah, listen to the patient. We want to get the patient happy. Uh, we don't want to get the doctor happy uh, and say, okay, I make everything full contour. My things are very strong, but the patient leaves unhappy with a, with a smile that is not up to what they dreamed of. So there's, the, yeah, there's, there's a lot of controversy about that. And, and the big thing I want to come back to is if there's controversy among doctors, go to what the patient wants and give that to the patient. Because that's what they're paying for, not for your opinion. So, anyways. No, no, no. You can be with that. No, no, 100%. Yeah. I agree. So, um, yeah, like I uh, said at Buff, we've got uh, between me and, when we, uh, and a couple of other guys, we started doing this with a natural smile. So, what is a natural smile for a patient? In our experience, it's what the patient wants a new, brighter smile and more natural. So it's basically as natural as what you can mimic it. So it's a natural looking teeth. For example, with the halo effect, I quite like the halo effect. And for instance, and, um, the patient doesn't always want it to be obvious when they did the smile makeover. So uh, a great way of doing that. And then the next one is the Hollywood smile. Right, sorry. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's <laughs> the natural look. Look, yeah, that's a natural look. So, sorry, guys, so I'm just checking out time as well. Yeah. So, um, on the right hand side, that's the halo effect with the super translucent tips um, with the mamelons. It's very, very detailed. On your left hand side, it's also detailed, but not that super trans translucent, but you can still see there's a little bit of halo effect. Hollywood smile. So, this is what the youth wants. They want the whiter, brighter, straighter smile. Tom Cruise style smile, and that's normally your bleach color. So it's your bleach one, two, three, four. Uh, that's a shade just below, uh, well, bleach four is a shade just below your B1. And then you get your B, uh, BL1, which is super white. And uh, in this case, I don't use a lot of built up here. I do mostly stain and glaze, and then maybe just on the tips, a little bit of a build up. Okay, uh, and then on your right hand side screen, uh, like I just said, uh, said to you guys, um, I did a little bit of a cut back on a tip just to put a little bit of translucency, just to break that even white. And on your left hand side, that's just full pressed shape and glaze. Okay, so here we, here we are now after the prep day, let's say seven, eight working days later, uh, we get the work from the lab. Two and weeks. Yeah, okay, let's say two weeks, bro. <laughs> Some cases, three weeks. Uh, depending on load shedding and all the other oh, stuff, all we, the other stuff, and stuff that we, and taxi wars and things like that. Beautiful South Africa. Uh, we, we eventually get the work from the lab. Uh, Sorry. The big thing is this year, uh, which I routinely do, is, is to do, do a dry drying. That's without any cement, anything. Just fit it in, check that the contacts are perfect, check that the fits are fine, run your probe over it quickly. Because um, you can get into a serious awkward position if the contacts are not right and you're pressing that stuff on with 
uh, with some weight and the whole smile just kind of presses skew and the, and when you like you uh, it's it's pretty much over um then you decide once you do that dry drying what i like to do is give the patient a mirror while they're lying down and they just kind of lift the mirror um to where they can see the the, the smile it will obviously look very raw because the gums are probably irritated from the from the temps uh, but you just give them indication and from there I once again put the with the um, the initiative in the patient's hands where they can then say doc I'm really happy or let's cement it with temp bond for a for a week and let's see how it heals up and then we make a decision uh, I like that idea of cementing it with temp bond um, because then I can really remove it send it back to Brahm if he needs to make adjustments without destroying any porcelain work. Because redo is, is really something that I'm allergic to and it's, it's really not fun. <laughs> and Brahm is even more. Uh, that's the only time we, we actually swear at each other uh, is during <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, Okay. And the big thing is, is if the patient chooses to do a 10 bond week, take photos immediately. Uh, once again, this will be your third set of photos. So the big thing is take photos the whole time. Um, some doctors think this is an evidence thing. It's really not. It's really info. Take as much data as you can at each opportunity. It will come back to you. The rest of the photos you don't use, leave them and forget about it, but take photos. Then if you, once you get to the final cementation, you can, you can really start enjoying it. Um, after you cement it, do a two week follow up, do a four week follow up. This is just really to, to, to uh, make sure that the patient is fine. It's not necessarily just to, to check the, uh, that everything looks nice, but it's, it's for function. Listen, patients can bite very weirdly when you, when they numb. So, yeah, so make sure that the occlusion is fine because the occlusion on your follow-up visits are the the main thing that will um, that will determine your longevity of your result. Look, we we're aiming for 20 years here. So if your occlusion isn't spot on from the start, um, uh, your your result won't last. The debonding will start, the chipping will start, and that's really your really? enemy here. But in two weeks to a month. Do your final uh, cementation and then afterwards organize more follow-ups. Visit the patient again because after a month when you cement the, 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 the final work, only a month later, the result will look like the photos here. It will never look immediately after cementation like this. I, I don't know, <laughs> not in my hands, but in any ways. Two weeks, month after follow up, take your photos for Instagram, Facebook. This is the fun part. This is where you start promoting your practice. Marketing. And obviously get permission from the patients to show their smiles. Uh, this is just a few other results. This is all that we just did this year. And um, it's everything from, from the Hollywood to the natural look, depending on what the patient wants. Okay, and uh, yeah, this is the end of our presentation. I think we're kind of on time. And the big thing is, as a dentist, um, it's it's a saying that be a, uh, keep your ceramics close. And and I was lucky enough to to be friends with Brom from the first day that that we kind of met. And after ten years, I must say, being good friends with your ceramics uh, makes it fun to work. And um, I, I look forward to to working with Brom. For a very long time still. For the next 20. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Short Ben. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Vin, uh, for uh, stepping in with me with this. That's great. Uh, like you said, uh, be friends, not em enemies. Uh, we all make mistakes. We all learn it through. Uh, it's uh, always somebody's fault, but at the end of the day, we still need to resolve it between the clinic and the lab. So at the end of the day, the patient is the most important person here. So um, I think uh, always uh, listen to the patient. Um, and then I think everything will go smoothly from then on. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, guys, for Thank joining you. us. That's it. OK, thanks so much, Dr. De Bien. But um, uh, I see we do have a few questions. And if anyone else wants to ask questions, we do have some time. So you can start typing the questions. Uh, I 
think, okay, if we can just go to the first question, I'm scared we're just going to be running out of time. The first one is from Anonymous. Do you do your own period work? And if so, do you, do, do you use lasers in your practice? Um, yes, I do use lasers in my practice. I did a two-year diploma um, in order to, to, to use uh, lasers correctly. Um, I do perio work up to a certain point where I feel comfortable and then I refer. So I don't, I don't believe in miracle work. The, the perio guys are unbelievable. So yeah, I, don't, I, I, yeah. So I, re, I do refer. Okay, cool. Second question again from Anonymous. How often do you have to redo your makeovers? Does it go with the terrain? Um, it definitely goes with the terrain because it depends on the, the, the type of patient that, that usually comes in for a makeover. Um, is, is, is like a, it's a fussy person, mostly. Uh, you, you do get the very nice ones, but it comes with the terrain. You know, yeah. no, definitely. If, you, if, you're doing, if you're doing a lot of makeovers, you can expect to redo some. Even with all the info we have, even if we do it technically perfect. By book. Yeah, by the book. The patient's perspective and the patient's, um, how they see it is not necessarily how we see it. So it comes with the terrain. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a dangerous yeah, yeah. playing field. It's like, a, yeah, I also said it uh, earlier. Uh, the patient comes in in the practice with uh, the picture of what she wants. And it's very difficult for the clinic or the lab to picture what she really wants. So that's why we try to break it up with a natural smile and a Hollywood smile just to eliminate that factor. But they still got this picture in the back of their mind. So it does happen. It's not always nice, but I always yeah. say it happens frequently, but it, but it, it, but it, it comes happen. with it the right. Yeah. yeah. It does. Okay, okay, perfect. Next question is, is the technician, so this is to Pram, is the technician in attendance at any time in the same room while you are seeing the patient? What are the legal implications of this in terms of the limitations of what the dental technician is allowed to undertake? Okay, um, Bram is only in attendance uh, if, I, uh, if the patient and I have discussed that I personally need him to be there. And then the patient has already, with that conversation, consented for the for the technician to be there. I, I would say that the, the technician is mostly there for shade taking in order to agree that the, that is the correct shade. And then maybe with some shape um, final, issues. Final shaping yeah, maybe shape issues. But, but the technician, you know, I don't think there's any legal implication once the patient and the doctor has already agreed that to complete this case correctly and as best as possible, the technician needs to be there. So it's not always, but there are some there are some cases where we discuss it with the patient and then go in. Okay. Oh, so it's basically where we do a little bit of final sh uh, shaping yeah. or uh, what we normally can't see in the lab. We we need to see it in the mouth of the trial and stuff like that. But we don't go uh, into oral and work with it. The, the doctor always does that part. So we just basically stand by and take pictures. Okay. Next one, uh, what are the exact specifications of the prep guide? What term of form material do you use that will allow easy separation of any material that goes into the term of form? I think that's for Bram. Okay, so uh, well, I use a, a product, uh, Shoei, so it's an uh, uh, American brand. Uh, I'm not uh, sorry, German brand, and I use normally 0.7 uh, millimeters or one millimeter. So this all depends on how many uh, wax up uh, teeth I did. So if it's the, the one three to the two three, for example, I will use the thinner one. And I, if I want more stabilization for the dentist, I will use the thicker one, which is the one mil. Um, it's just a guide, so it doesn't do anything invasive with it or something is just a guide to see if you took enough away on a prep or doesn't need to take it away at all like uh, Vim said to save all the dentine so it's you can actually do it with any form uh, of a vacuum form like a retainer type of material it's just a see-through guide so you want to see basically through it yeah, you know, and I, I myself never used it before. And I think, Bram, you sent me one on the last case that we, we're doing together. 
And I've always, you know, from, from a personal point of view, like sometimes I would think like, I, you know, I, I, Bram sends me the model, the lower model and says, you didn't teach you enough or something. And in my head, I'm, I want to swear at him to say, ah, just, just do the damn thing and get done. So <laughs> with the minute you put this thing in, it prevents my swearing at him and you swearing at me. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a nice little trick, that one. Okay, no, it's great to know. Okay, the next question goes on to speak about the cost that the dentist and or technician incur up to the wax up stage. What if the patient does not go along with the sales talk? What has been the cost up to that stage? So I'll quickly just, again, uh, on this, you know, with costing, we get into competition commission rules and everything. We're not really allowed to answer it, but obviously the dentist does charge for this. I, I personally charge as well, uh, and the technician charges as well. So there's not really a loss if, if, if the patient doesn't go along. And I think uh, Dr. Debeer mentioned in the pre uh, presentation as well, you do make a small profit on, on the wax up and on the mock up, trying the teeth in. And if the patient doesn't take it, yeah, you, you make a profit, and then you can use the other uh, advantages of that the pictures, the before, after, et cetera, for, for uh, social media and that. So let's, let's, let's leave that one is done, I think. Uh, again, someone is asking what is the cost of planning and coding for DEMS? Uh, there, are, there are some codes I know in the SADA guide that allows for DEMS, but according, according to what I know, most medical aids don't pay for this. No, it the, is a private cost, but yeah, Dr. De Beer can maybe uh, just speak no, about that. The, a bit. the, the big thing is, is as soon as you do this kind of work, you have to know that that coding won't really come to your rescue. It's it's really it's cosmetic work. Medical aids don't cover for it, and um, yeah, it's contracted out work mostly. Definitely. Thank you. Cool. That's, that's about it. Okay. Uh, one more question. What what part do you use for the labial prep, particularly in the gingival area? Uh, I'm not sure how will you explain what type of uh, 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 um, Maybe we can say focus of the five or five to seven words I use throughout the whole spread. So I don't use just one. I use it quite a lot. Yeah, so maybe, so, maybe yeah, if you can just WhatsApp me some photos, whoever is asking this question can contact me and I'll just show them a few of the yes, photos. No, of the no, no, I will. I will. I will say that through. Okay. Okay, the next, oh, sure, we still got eight questions to go through. Let's just go oh, quickly. Oh. Is there not a move away from destruction of healthy tooth material, but more towards injection molding using composites? Sorry, can you just repeat that question? Sorry. Uh, okay, let me just get that one quickly. Is there not a move away from destruction of healthy tooth material, but more towards injection techniques, molding using composites? Yes, that is definitely a general trend these days. Um, but really, the, it's, it's once again up to the patient. Just to have a discussion with the patient and really hear what they want out of it. And definitely using resin bonding, is a, is a definite definite option here. Yeah. But we were just having this discussion in regards to doing a small makeover with porcelain, so we mostly focused on that. It's really hard to cover that as well in an in a hour webinar. Okay, the next question is from the man himself, Dr. Mark Paus. He says, surely the final restoration should be a copy of the mock-up, not decided after the preps in full TSC workflow, we use copy and paste concepts. So using natural algorithms from natural teeth, which means full contour monolithics. What do you feel about this? Yeah, I think uh, Mark always uh, asks the, the best questions. Um, I think this is just uh, a, a very much a personal choice from clin clinician to clinician. Um, yeah, I, I feel very strongly for the guys who, who prefer like a, a monolithic a crown because obviously it has, has beautiful advantages. And the whole TSD workflow, I think there's much to discuss about it. I don't, I'm not sure, Mark, you and I can, can discuss that question a little bit later. Thanks. Yeah, we are, we are running out of time, so we can yeah. discuss that behind the scenes. Uh, next one, if porcelain crowns are cemented with tampon, how do you remove them if the margins are flush without chipping the edges? Chipping the edges, you, you don't. 
you know, at them bond, it, it, it just come, it comes oh, off quite no, easily. No, I mostly use uh, the edges just from the from just from the template with the pro. And then the rest just with a very smooth little uh, diamond blur. And it usually doesn't chip. So I'm not sure about that one. The next one is what tools do you use for gingivectomies and crown maintenance? Uh, mostly I, I use the, the water laser eye plus. And uh, it's, it's really a very nice system. But that's also a lecture on its own because. Um, even though we use the laser, we still prefer to, to open up when, when we do the crown link. Um, yeah, that's a discussion on its, on its own. But I used to, I must use the, the laser in company with uh, surgical work. So not, I can't really separate them. They, they, they are together. Okay. Uh, the next question is, where do you buy the flash you showed, the one for your phone? Uh, maybe if you bought yeah, the uh, the smile line, uh, the smile line. You can actually this uh, think it actually made it uh, in South Africa is bringing them in on the moment. Otherwise, you can actually buy it through other car by Gary. Uh, he also sells them. I don't think he's got it in stock, but he will pre-order it for you in the future. It's not a problem, but it's uh, <coughs> remarkable to have. It's not an expensive thing. You can use it with Android and Apple. It's easy. Okay. If, if you just send me that details and I can just uh, uh, send it to whoever it was an, an anonymous, anonymous question. So whoever is asking can just WhatsApp me and I'll send that details to you as well. Uh, okay. Almost done, three left. How do you clean your crowns after using Tempon and do you have to etch the crowns again? Um, no, um, yes, you can. You can etch the crown again. I I crown, what, do you, what do you prefer? Well, 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 when you try it in, it's yeah. a dry, it's a dry, it's a dry try in. So there's no actually water base or anything on it. So yeah, but what he's talking about is when we temp on it. So it's definitely I would I would uh, itch it again. Yeah, right? we will then definitely after that we will itch it again and then do the cementation. Thanks, John, for the question. The last one is what is your favorite material of choice for anterior and posterior crowns? Your favorite material for anterior base. Well, um, to be quite honest, it all depends on your space. Uh, I quite like Emacs all the time. Uh, I think Emacs is strong enough. If you've got a severe uh, bruxivation, then obviously that's a no go. Then go to zirconium. But uh, live with the silicate, you can go for it. So if you've got a space and you actually prepare the tube well, uh, you won't have any problems. Yeah, the, the patient's actual problem that, that they come in with really determines the, the best material to choose. And um, yeah, otherwise than that, you can't really say what is your favorite. It's, it's really what the patient wants and needs and what they want to achieve out of it. So it's very important to once again, listen to the patient and uh, be diligent in, in diagnosing correctly. So yeah, there's the, you can't pick a favorite here. Okay, one more question. How would you prevent attrition to opposing lower anterior teeth if the patient has crowns anteriorly in the maxilla? Uh, it's just basics. Uh, I would say just um, uh, as, a, as a rule, just make a bite flight. See as that. <laughs> okay. And then the last one is again a comment from Dr. Mark who says, thanks guys for the great lecture. And on that note, I would also once again like to thank Bram and Dr. De Pia on behalf of the South African Dental Association, myself, and all the viewers for taking time from your personal and work schedules to do this. In fact, they're still sitting at the surgery uh, presenting from there. So they're leaving their loved ones at home. We appreciate all the hard work that you put into the presentation and the dedication to the profession at large. So I think that's a wrap for tonight. Thank you to everyone for joining in and taking part in this webinars, uh, as well as previous webinars. You know, these webinars are only a success if you guys come and join in. It, it's pointless if me and Dr. Debia and Brahma are sitting and then just chatting to ourselves. Everyone, please stay safe and take care. And I hope to see you all at the virtual Congress on the 27, 28, and 29 of this month. Thanks.
Thanks, guys. Thank you very much for the opportunity. We appreciate it. And uh, yeah. yeah, enjoy. Thank you very much. It was a lot of fun. We enjoyed it. Thanks.